Alrighty, I think we're good to go. So hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to Texas A&M International University's International Women in Academia panel. My name is Ana Maria Vargas and I serve as the university's Associate Director of Web and I also serve as TANU Staff Senate President. So today, in celebration and commemoration of Women's History Month at TAMU, we'll be having a discussion with various female faculty members from here and from various parts of the world. They'll be sharing their stories on how they entered the life of academia, discuss the challenges that they may have encountered, and of course, give advice for those who would like to follow in their footsteps. This panel is being brought to you by TAMU's Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity Committee, or the TIDE Committee for the Cool Kids. Everyone who's interested in participating in the campus uh, activities related to diversity and inclusion, or who would like to know more about TIDE activities and offerings, can visit the university's diversity and inclusion website at tamu.edu slash diversity. So, before we introduce our panelists, I want to um, let everybody know that um, if you have any questions that you would like to ask our panelists, make sure to drop it in the chat below so that we can answer it during our Q&A segment. We'll also have Ms. Elizabeth Dezouche, uh, information literacy librarian from the Sue and Radcliffe Killam Library moderating today's chat. So shout out to her for helping us to host this on the library's Facebook page. Please be sure to like their page if you haven't already done so. And also moderating today's chat, we're going to have Ms. Mika Akikuni, the Associate Director of Marketing for uh, the University and the co-chair of the TIE Committee. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Maria de Lourdes Vidoria, who is our Associate Professor of Education. We also have Dr. Mary Victor Regosa, the Dean of the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. We have Dr. Sharmin Hassan, Assistant Professor of Biology. We have Dr. Haley Kazin, University College Assistant Professional. We have Dr. Lola Norris, Associate Professor of Spanish and Translation. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Manaz Momin, Associate Professor of Public Administration. These women faculty members come from here and from international origins, and they've adapted to vastly different countries and higher education systems. They engaged in various international projects as well, such as research and programs. So ladies, thank you for joining us today. We're super excited to get started. Uh, I'm gonna go around uh, the virtual room and have everyone briefly um, tell us about yourself, about your social and your cultural and, ac and academic background. So I would like to start with Dr. Viloria, whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you, Anna. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. I uh, am born and raised, I was born and raised in Laredo, uh, Texas, but uh, my family um, ancestry is comes from both, um, I'm a third generation Texan, but a first generation Mexican American woman. Um, my family is from the Guanajuato area, and most recently my mother's family was, um, I, still I have a lot of family in Monterrey, Mexico. And so um, I, my research interests are place-based educational leadership, local agency as it means to preserve diversity and foster educational equity in both rural and non-rural schools. My primary goal is to prepare educational leaders who are equipped with research-based culturally responsive leadership practices and STEM-based knowledge to lead in public school systems. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Viloria. And I'd like to now move on to Dr. Maravik Torregosa. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maravik Torregosa. I migrated to the United States when I was 23. Um, I started my job as a nurse in New York City. And then in 20, when I was 24, I moved down to Laredo for a nursing job. Since then, um, I think I've, after I uh, finished my master's degree in family nursing practice, I moved to TAMU uh, as a clinical assistant, clinical instructor. And then from there, from there, I went up for promotion and tenure and now the Dean for the College of Nursing. So it's been a long journey and along the way, there's been a lot of challenges, but the lesson I learned is you just have to be like water, settle in where you are, where God will place you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Torregosan. Uh, I'd like to now move on to Dr. Shanin Hassan. 
Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharmin Hassan. I grew up in the northern part of Bangladesh uh, in a metropolitan city, which is named Rajshahi, and is also known as the educational city of Bangladesh. And both of my parents worked in academia. I grew up in a household where I have regularly seen my parents getting prepared for lectures, engaging in academic discussion, grading, etc., which I believe heavily influenced me to choose my future career path as an educator. So to fulfill my cherished desire to become a scientist, I applied for a Japan government scholarship, which I received, and I went to Japan to do my master's degree and later PhD. So I received my PhD from Japan in 2015, and I moved to United States as a postdoctoral research fellow uh, in Temple University, Philadelphia. And uh, since then, I have moved to different uh, multiple states, and I encountered different cultures and working in excellent institutions and I think those have greatly shaped me today who I am. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Hassan. And I'd like to now move on to Dr. Haley Kazin. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I grew up in rural Texas. My uh, town that I grew up in was very small, only about 3,000 people, very small high school. Uh, and then I went to the University of Texas, so it was uh, quite shocking. Um, I did not have a college going tradition in my family. So I am a first generation college student um, and I, I have taught at TAMU for over 20 years. Um, got one of my degrees from here and my PhD from a and College Station. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kazin. Next up we have Dr. Lola Norris. Good afternoon. So um, I'm Hispano Swiss. I grew up in Switzerland um, in a multilingual, multicultural environment. German is my dominant language, and I did all my schooling in German in Switzerland from elementary school uh, to my first college degree. I came to the United States as an adult because uh, my husband um, was indigenous, was an American citizen. And so I worked as a translator and as an interpreter, which was uh, my um, undergraduate degree. For, um, for many years, I did not really come to academia um, uh, taking the straight path. Uh, my road was uh, very winding. I had a family, I had children, I was a professional woman, but I did not uh, go to graduate school until after my husband passed. And I got my master's degree as a widow with six children. So very different from um, what uh, you typically think of a professor's path uh, to uh, teaching at a university. I'm also a uh, first generation. Uh, my parents did not have a college degree. And um, I um, love what I'm doing, but it's kind of my second career. My first career was being a professional translator and interpreter. That's great. Thanks so much for sharing, Dr. Norris. And lastly, we have Dr. Manaz Moman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm from Bangladesh, and a lot of people, a lot of my students, they are not aware of where Bangladesh is. Today is actually the 50th year of Bangladesh liberation. But what is interesting is when I was growing up, it was one of the poorest countries in the world. And in this 50 years, things have changed tremendously. You know, there has been a lot of economic growth, but also it is also true. I grew up in a much more secular and much more uh, like a peaceful you know, country uh, than what it is now. So, you know, there has been a flip in this 20, 25 years. I have been here. Uh, I did my master's from Canada. Then I was in Cleveland State University where I did my PhD and I've been here almost 19 years now. Very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Moman. So I'd like to ask a uh, first question and I'm going to um, direct this to Dr. Viloria. So Dr. Viloria, can you tell us about your academic and career mentors? Yes, uh, I will. Um, I also want to say that first and foremost, as a first generation um, university student and college student, it is very important. Um, the people that have molded me and have helped me along the way um, through my academic career and my career mentors, um, I believe there were strong 
my life, first and foremost, my mother. And then, you know, when I, um, when I left Laredo to go to the University of Texas, I had a men like a fellowship with Dolores Huerta, and she's she's known for the United Farm Workers, and she has you know social activists, and she has done a lot of work with the Hispanic community. Um, well, and in addition to that, you know there were two high school teachers that had that helped me throughout my journey, and that was the, my English teacher, and she's still a practicing educator in the Laredo area in United ISD. Her name is Mary Lou Lopez, and my high school teacher. Minita Ramirez, you know, she basically was the one that helped me along the way and, and helped me actually take my first um, trip outside of Laredo and to Washington, D.C. And that was a huge experience and a huge eye opener for me. Um, as a school principal, I've had a lot of mentors through the through both school districts. Um, and I also want to say that teachers you know, all the teachers that have touched my life and you know, whether I had a supervisory role or I had a collegial role with them, they have um, and they continue to teach me a lot of what I do and also to pass it on to, uh, you know, future educators in, in the community. Um, my dissertation uh, chair, you know, at Texas A&M um, College Station, Dr. Wendelin Webb Hassan, she also, you know, was very instrumental in, in in my path towards completing my PhD because I was a full-time school principal. So, so she definitely, you know, was very, very flexible and, and worked with me along the way. And after um, I joined TAMEU, there was a very, there's still, you know, someone that I really uh, treasure because of her mentorship as far as the PNT process. And that's Dr. Selena Mireles. You know, she she is no longer with TAMEU, but she was uh, the associate dean at, in the College of Education, and she, she did work with me um, so that I could go through the PNT process um, and complete that uh, successfully. And most recently, I have you know the women in this panel. Of course, I look up to them; they're my colleagues, but we respect each other and we learn from each other. And of course, you know, in the faculty senate, I have Dr. Lola Norris, who's a member of this panel, and she has really helped me also navigate the acad uh, academia space. So thank you for allowing me to share that with you today. I definitely shared the, in your sentiments, Dr. Gloria. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Dr. Torregosa, I'd like to um, give you the next question. So as a woman, what are some of the challenges that you might have had to overcome in order to be where you are today? Um, so I will start that with uh, saying that I started my career here in the United States as a nurse. And certainly being a nurse is not an easy job. It is a tough job. And on top of that, I had to learn uh, here in Laredo, I had to learn Spanish. When I worked in New York City, that wasn't a problem. But then when I migrated here, I had to learn Spanish because if I don't, then this patient would prefer another nurse. So I have to overcome that. And instead of being frustrated and mad, I have to learn it. And because it is important for me to understand the concern of the other person. Over time, uh, my patients appreciated that. But on that journey, I have to learn mental toughness, resilience. And that actually, the things that I learned in that career as a nurse, I'm still a nurse, and I took that with me in academe because in academe, you know, I have now to deal with students, faculty, attitudes of students, attitudes of faculty, and my experience with dealing with difficult doctors, difficult uh, patients as a nurse actually helped me uh, with this job that I am in now. So I'm navigating different waters, uh, constituents, colleagues, and that has really helped me cope with the, with the demands of the job. So that's what brought me today, the resilience of being a nurse. It's a great Thank story. You. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Hassan, next question uh, coming up for you. So how has your experience influenced the way that you mentor students today? Thank you very much. So I have always thought that the experience I went through in my personal and professional life weren't just for me, but perhaps I could uh, I've shared this uh, with someone else to help them get through their journey in academia. So I have had excellent academic mentors during my graduate study as well as my postdoc career. 
and I had two babies in between this time. I, I got my first child in my during my graduate study and I got the next one in, during my postdoctoral years. And those mentors actually taught me about kindness, generosity and values. And they helped me to shape my academic career with their thoughtful suggestions as well as recommendation. So I believe that quality mentoring relationship have powerful impact on students in a variety of personal, academic and professional situations. So ultimately mentoring connects on young people uh, for uh, their personal growth and development and social and economic opportunity. Today, as a mentor, I practice the core values I have learned uh, over the years, and I try to assure my students that there is someone who cares about them, and I reassure them that they are not alone in dealing the day-to-day -day challenge they face and make them feel like they matter. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Um, so, Dr. Kazan, I would like to direct uh, the next question to you. So, who is or who are your heroine or your heroines? So I was thinking about this after I got my question, and um, the the person that I thought about was my is my grandmother. She's ninety one years old, um, but she she married very young, and she was a widow with eight children by the time she was thirty eight. So uh, my my grandfather died very young, and so she had about an eighth grade education, uh, and she had eight children. So she somehow made it work. You know, she got a job at the factory. She did side jobs, and and she made it work. And one of her greatest accomplishments uh, that she will say is that all eight of her children um, graduated from high school, which is something that you know she she was not able to do. And four of them, not my not including my mother, but four of her siblings uh, did graduate from from college. And most of her grandchildren do have college degrees. So she went from uh, you know, having an eighth grade education and being alone and, and raising eight children and working multiple jobs and trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, to were in two generations, you know, most of her grandchildren uh, and now great grandchildren actually um, have college degrees. So I chose my, my grandmother as one of my heroines. Very inspiring. I love it. Thank you, Dr. Kazan. Uh, so, Dr. Momin, I'd like to direct uh, the next question over to you. So, tell us about the impact that you have had uh, on your field. Oh, mute, unmute the mic. Sorry. Sorry. It I, happens. Teach, I teach political science and public administration courses, and my main research areas are citizenship, immigration. So what I try to do is when I look at what are the things that interest me, you know, usually the topic is very multidisciplinary. I wrote a book on citizenship where I tried to kind of push the boundary of public administration because a lot of time the discipline is uh, like looks at uh, uh, has a very narrow focus. So I want to expand that and my next work or my next book was on political satire. So that was also. Uh, you know, within the realm of uh, political science, but I also, uh, you know, took into account a lot of changes that happened with media, a lot of changes that happened with, uh, you know, language. So most of my research, what I try to do is expand the kind of, you know, push the boundary. Right now, I'm working on a book on Laredo. Uh, I, I mm, uh, did my PhD at Cleveland State University, which is very strong, uh, you know, urban study school. So when I moved to Laredo, it was like very frustrating to me because Laredo didn't fit under any of the urban theories perspective. So it always baffled me. So finally, now I'm trying to you know, figure that out. So I hope that will be something uh, you know, meaningful uh, because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to capture the people's voice, you know, not only looking at Laredo from the, uh, you know, from the theory, but looking at Laredo from the eyes of and the voices of their, you know, of the people. And in my classrooms, because of my, uh, all the experiences I have, I try to kind of uh, broaden the perspective of the, you know, students, not only in terms of, you know, the discipline, but I also, you know, kind of is, is try to be very conscious about their worldviews and try to incorporate that or try to add whatever I have learned in my journey, you know, whether that, that would be helpful for Thank you, Dr. Norman. I'm very interested in, in reading that book once it's finished up. Um, so, Dr. Norris, I would like to uh, direct the next question to you. So, 
what would you like to see changed in the higher education environment to facilitate women's advancement into leadership positions in academia? Thank you for this question, Anna. So I think that in the past 25 years, we have come a long way. More women graduate from college now. In fact, currently more women are earning bachelor's degrees than men. We also have more women pursuing master's and doctoral degrees. However, when it comes to equal pay and leadership positions in academia, we still have quite a way to go to reach parity. Uh, most uh, upper administration positions are still held by men, and women tend to earn less than their male counterparts. And while there are more women in positions of deans and provosts and even university presidents in Texas, public universities, about one third of all university presidents are women. But it seems that uh, there are fewer women in department chair positions, the entry level of higher education administration. There's even more disparity for women of color. Uh, women are also underrepresented in tenure and full um, tenure in full professorships. So there's still a lot of work ahead of us um, because women have a lot to contribute to higher education. I believe though that we are on the right path. What can we do better or how can we do better? I think, first of all, um, universities need to be aware of the disparity, recognize it, and be willing to make changes to fix it. University leadership um, needs to make more efforts to promote qualified women and support them in their quest for leadership positions. We, as women in leadership positions, must mentor younger uh, colleagues and encourage them to become leaders to advance, to be committee chairs, to take on department chairmanships, to apply for deanships. We have to encourage them. We have to mentor them. We need more role models um, in leadership for women in academia. And we ourselves need to set examples for younger colleagues and make sure that our gains are not lost, but built upon. But I think we are moving in the right direction. Thank I agree, you. and I see I see everybody nodding their heads. I'm I'm sure we all definitely agree uh, with your words, Dr. Norris. Uh, I have another question. This one for Dr. Viloria. So, Dr. Viloria, what advice will you share with students and professionals who wish to follow uh, your footsteps? Yes, um, and I thought about this question, and what I came up with is is having you know I believe in three pillars. Um, first and foremost, um, your family. Your family will support you along the way, and when you know you find yourself going through the difficult uh, path, in, in some cases, um, if, if you're not academically prepared, you know those are the foundational foundational um, issues that you need to deal with. But your family will always be there to support you. So family always should come first. And then second, the second pillar, I, I really believe in mentors, you know, seek like Dr. Norris and all of us here in our, in our panel, we have had mentors. We have had those individuals that have cared, have listened, have, um, you know, cried with us, have laughed with us um, and just been there, you know, as a helping hand and sometimes in the shadows and sometimes just, you know, along side by side, you know, as colleagues. So, so, you know, you need to find a mentor, someone that you can, confide in, and also someone that is going to um, give you constructive criticism because, you know, we're not perfect, okay? We have to learn, and every day is a, it's a different learning day. It's, it's an opportunity for you to become a stronger person, a stronger woman, and, a, and then a stronger mentor. Be ethical. You know, your ethics are it's your moral compass. You have to be an ethical person, and that will help you um, be impartial and also, you know, pass it on as far as, you know, in, 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 I know lately we've heard a lot of social justice, you know, what is social justice? Um, I see social, so, social justice as an advocate, you know, being an advocate for those that maybe have um, a softer voice or maybe haven't uh, learned how to advocate for themselves. 
So that's gonna help you not only be a mentor, but also to pay it forward and be equitable. So those are my uh, words of advice. I hope um, you know you know where to find us. So if, if there are still, you know individuals or students in the in 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 today's audience that would like more information, I don't mind being a mentor. I love being a mentor, so I'm here to help. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Villoria. And uh, last question from me before we turn it over to the audience. And audience, just a friendly reminder, if you have any uh, additional questions, uh, just feel free to put them in the chat so that we can ask them during our Q&A. So, Dr. Melman, uh, last question. So, can you share your reflections on the significance of Women's History Month? So, whenever we are uh, celebrating a particular group of people, whether it's women, African American or Hispanic, usually it is a response to historical injustices. So one of the most important focus is try to figure out what voices were silenced, what part of history uh, basically have been uh, erased. Now, one of the uh, a very good example that comes to my mind about Laredo is the absence of celebrating Jovita Idar. You know, who was a journalist and who was actually uh, like a you know feminist who should like whenever we are talking about Hispanic history or women's history, I mean that should be one of the first names, right? I mean we, we should uh, know about. And I ha I know students in Laredo who have finished high school never ever you know heard about her. It's only lately I think last year in the Bartlett Soccer Park we have a trail uh, are named after her. And it is after so many years in Laredo, I think the first, uh, you know, statue or bust of Cesar Chavez, uh, you know, it's probably already there in Bruni Plaza, but it took, you know, so many years, right? So whenever we are talking about the Women's History Month, you know, one part of it is not only celebrating what is like, uh, what are the current achievement, but also looking at the past and especially paying special attention to the part that are erased, but that are or silent or you know not highlighted, but that are that play a very important role. And actually, for Laredo, the Women's History Month, I think one of the main focus should be you know every children in Laredo should know about you know Obita Idar. Otherwise, you know how can we celebrate you know Women's History Month? So it it gives us these opportunities uh, to look at the you know uh, other the silent parts of history and focus on these. Completely agree. So thank, thank you so much, Dr. Moman, for for sharing that. So moving on to the questions and answers from our audience, we have our first question uh, from Facebook user uh, Anis Shivani. Uh, she has a question. Um, they have a question for those of you not from the U.S. Do you wonder about how your life would have been as an academic had you stayed in your place of origin? And if you do wonder about it. Does the recognition of the differences allow you to be creative in certain ways as a U.S. academic? So who wants to take on this question first? Okay, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> okay, so yes, I have often wondered about that. And I felt, especially the first few years of teaching, I always wondered if I was teaching back in Bangladesh, would I have a closer relation, closer connection to the students or not. Now, I don't think I, I wonder about that a lot because, you know, with time, most probably I don't, I'm not that much concerned about the cultural difference. I'm more concerned about the age difference, you know, which would be very similar wherever I would be. But it is also true that I, throughout my experiences, I have learned, a, you know, a lot. I have learned, uh, you know, like uh, in, in terms of how to navigate kind of, you know, the cultural landscape, you know, what are the problematic areas? I mean, all of those things. So if I had stayed back, I would have definitely have a much more kind of, you know, like rich knowledge about, you know, that region, about South Asia, Bangladesh. I would probably, uh, in terms of my research, would be completely different. But I am not sure whether as a teacher, how different I would be. But I'm, I'm, I'm you know, 100% sure that my research interest would be very, very different. Thank you, Dr. Moman. Does anybody else uh, have anything they want to add to that question? 
Um, I would like to add, to add something to that. Um, had I stayed at the, in the Philippines, I probably would still be a nurse and uh, working in the hospital. I never dreamed to be a dean. So this is actually like a shock to me that I'm in this position. So like, um, I never imagined myself when I was young to be a dean. So I just kind of like, I don't know what happened, but it was there and I just grabbed it. But one thing is that I'm also a risk taker. So I jump and then later on figure out, you know, later on, uh, how will I survive in this uh, situation? But um, leaving the country is actually a great risk. You know, leaving your hometown, leaving your parents, it's, you approach yourself from one culture to the other. So for me as a nurse and going into an academic setting is also uprooting myself from my, you know, my comfort zone. And that's, I think I can describe myself with that, a risk taker. So to answer your question will be, will I be a dean in the, in the Philippines if I were there? Maybe the answer to that is no, because I'll probably be staying on the same uh, area and just be comfortable on that comfort zone. Thank you. Thank you I would Dr. like to say something too. I'm sorry. Um, no, go ahead. Um, I, I feel the same way as Dean Torregosa. Um, if I had stayed in Switzerland, I would have probably continued with my profession uh, as a translator and interpreter, and I may never have ventured into academia. And it also depends on what your your new home country provides to you and who is there. And as we um, have uh, heard about mentors, my mentor was in the United States and my mentor uh, encouraged me to get a graduate degree to get a PhD, something that I would have never even thought that I could do. So it kind of depends on who um, is meant to lead you where, who is, is in your path. And um, I probably have to say the same thing as, as Dean Torregosa. I, I'm not sure that I would have been an academic if I had stayed in Switzerland. A professional, yes. And maybe I would have taught a couple of courses here or there at the university. But a full-fledged tenured um, uh, associate professor as I am now, probably not. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Norris. Do you have anybody else that would like to add to that question before we move on to another one? Last call. <laughs> okay, so we have a question for Dr. Hassan. Dr. Hassan, can you tell us a little more about your experience in Japan as a PhD student? Um, what did you find interesting about Japan and what advice will you have for somebody who would like to pursue their graduate studies abroad? Thank you very much, Anna. And thanks to the uh, question, because I actually wanted to speak about Japan, the experience, the unique experience I encountered in Japan. The challenge that I faced is uh, the language barrier. I think most of uh, you all know that uh, in Japan, we need to learn Japanese uh, to survive. So I had, a, I had a tough time to understand the scientific discussion that was held in Japanese, even at the University of Tokyo. So um, they offered, they are, they are kind enough to offer me some English courses and I, I could actually take some English courses instead of the courses being offered in Japanese. And the professors were kind enough that sometimes they provided some handouts in English so that I can at least follow the slides what's being taught in the class uh, in Japanese. So that was a good experience. And I, what I found in uh, Japan is the people, uh, the, the, my professors, the students, the environment, they're all very helpful uh, to the international uh, students. So I highly encourage uh, anybody who wants to uh, go to Japan for their high studies. And also they offer scholarships uh, to, I think, to many, many of the countries. So if they can get a scholarship, I, I think that would give them a very good experience uh, in academia, particularly in Japan. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Um, we have another question and this is directed to everybody. Uh, can you tell us about countries that you have visited as part of your research and how those experiences informed how you impart your classes to your students? So I don't know who would like to tackle this one first. Um, 
So actually, my research is on when I was a PhD student. Uh, my research is on student success among students from underrepresented underrepresented populations, but that was conducted here in um, in Texas in seven schools universities here in, in in Texas. But the results of the study has actually informed me in my teaching. Um, I was able to publish three pub, uh, three manuscripts from that dissertation. So. Those things that I learned from that research has informed me as an academician, as a faculty, and also strategies on how to make uh, students from this population be successful in nursing. Thank you. Um, I haven't uh, done research abroad, but uh, as part of the Reading the Globe, um, I took students all over the world for about 10 years, um, India, Africa, Brazil, many, many places. And for me, as far as teaching, uh, that's been just the greatest joy is watching students learn about other places. And so we've had many students who had never been out of Laredo, never been on an airplane, and then they go to these uh, these places, you know, like India and Ghana, and um, just watching them discover new cultures and discover new places um, and really broadening their horizons and opening up their minds uh, has been really the best part, one of the best parts of my career. Thank you, Dr. Kazin, and thank you, Dr. Torosa. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to answer a part of this question before I move on to the next one? Yes, I would like to chime in also. Um, I love to travel, and um, I've traveled to many countries for pleasure, but it's never just pleasure because you always learn. And what I tell my students is the more you travel, the more, to the more tolerant of a human being you become because there's so many different ways to do things. There's so many different ways to live, to study, to work. It's not just what we see in our surrounding. So in order to be a better human being, then, you, know, you have to travel. But I have done research um, uh, for, my, for my dissertation, for my book. Um, I do uh, historical linguistics. So I have traveled to the archives in Spain and in Mexico. And uh, another thing that that you know I have done because I think traveling is so important for for us as um, academics and for our students the future of academia is um, like Dr. Kaysen um, done study abroad programs. So my husband, who is also a professor um, at TAMU, we have done programs of study abroad to Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay. We did this for several years, and um, it was very interesting because students, uh, for some reason, thought that you know Spanish is only spoken in, in Mexico, and then there's no other countries that speak Spanish. So being able to travel to South America and being able to communicate uh, in Spanish and see other cultures that are similar but not the same as as Mexican culture uh, was very very interesting. And two years ago, we did a study abroad program. Uh, with another professor, Tamiu, to, uh, to Malaga in Spain. And this is really um, one of the things that I enjoy very, very much is to teach our students in this study abroad um, setting uh, because they get so much out of it uh, academically and, and also in personal uh, growth. So I think definitely traveling uh, for research and for study is essential uh, for anybody in academia. Thank you. I would like to add something. So it's not really related that much to travel abroad, but it's after teaching here for years and years, I was um, like kind of, you know, I took notice of the very different kind of education system I myself have gone through. My education was much less structured. Like for instance, in the undergrad, we never had a, uh, you know, like an assigned textbook. You know, like, so everyone had to think for themselves, you know, much more than the way we do here in classrooms. And uh, when I was growing up, we kind of, you know, looked up to the Western education system and I, I never really acknowledged a lot of the positive things that I, I had in my culture, in my education system. So after teaching here for a long time, I think I'm much more aware and sensitive towards that. And I try to, you know, bring that in as much as possible. 
So it's not really only about going to new places, but also looking at the back, you know, with new eyes, you know, so that, you know, just, just that realization of, oh my God, I mean, these are the things I already know. So why can't I use it in my classroom? So that has been a very interesting experience for me. Thank you all for sharing that. Thank you, Dr. Norris and Dr. Moman for your answers. So a uh, question uh, from Facebook from Christine Rojas to any of the panelists. If you could meet any influential woman from throughout history, whom would you choose and why? So who would like to take? Uh... Mm -hmm. Loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> it's like <laughs> of all women. Um. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. Um, so during my postdoctoral years, I worked with a cell called HeLa cells. So I didn't know much about HeLa cells. What does it mean? Later, I searched it. I, out of curiosity, I googled it. What is HeLa cells? And I found out that uh, that cell has been taken from an African American woman, and that cell is supposed uh, as immortal cells. That uh, she suffered from cervical cancer, and the cells of that cancer cells has been taken by one physician, and he cultured that uh, in the lab. And throughout the years, I think um, over sixty years, we all scientists all over the world are using her cells, the cervical cancer cells to study cancer and whatever treatment, whatever clinical aspect, when we, when we uh, do a clinical test, we usually test it on uh, the cells uh, we derived from Miss um, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, her name was Henrietta Lacks and from her name, the cell uh, is named as HeLa. So I often wondered, and as I work still today, I work with HeLa cells. I often wonder if I could meet her in person and she was never recognized very lately. Uh, some people did research on her and they actually published a book on her, Henrietta Lacks, uh, the uh, history of uh, immortal cells. So I'd, I'd love to meet her in person. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Does anybody else have anything that we, they would like to add to that question? It's tough, I think, to think of just one woman that you would be able to to meet. Um, I'd like to add to that. For me, I'd like to meet, if she were alive today, Florence Nightingale, the mother of nursing. Um, back then, you know, she helped in the Crimean War, but her theory on ventilation, we still use that today in the pandemic. Um, infection control. So back then she has this advanced thinking on how to heal and treat people with very little knowledge i am going to assume back in the days but we are still using her theory her strategies to this day so i would like to if she were alive i would like to meet her that's a, she's a genius i mean having this you know theory and practices that we are still practicing today thank you um, does anybody else have one that uh, they want to add before we move on to another question? All right, so let me go ahead and move on to this one. So this is the, another question to everybody. So in your travels abroad, have you encountered any favorite phrases that impart wisdom? And can you share them in that language and tell us what it means in English? So who'd like to take that question? Okay, so let me read that question out again. So have you encountered any phrases that impart wisdom and can you share them in a language and tell us what that means in English. Uh, 
I have no phrases in English, so I'm useless in this one. <laughs> You know, I, I could just add that, you know, one of, I'm, it's, this is something that I, it's always been in, in my family as querer es poder. It's wisdom because, you know, my mother would always tell us, you know, if you have the, the will to want something, you're, you're going to be able to, su to succeed at that. You know, so the wisdom has always been that, you know, es querer es poder. So if you want to, you know, accomplish, you have a goal, you just have to want to do it. You know, your drive, your resilience is, is, you know, it's in you to accomplish it. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's something that I grew up with. Um, it's a Spanish, uh, you know, saying. So, you know, I can, I can share that with everyone. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to move on to a question uh, from Paolo Lozano on Facebook. Uh, the question is, what effects have you seen on each future generation? Moreover, I, as a second generation Mexican American, have noticed that every generation that comes after the first and the second generation are not as interested in pushing themselves in education and professions because they've had things easier. Have you all noticed this and what can we do to remedy this? Um, I, can, I can add, I can answer that question. Um, so part of my research um, has been focused on third generation Mexican American teachers, because as a school principal, what I had experienced and what I began to experience as the years, you know, as, as um, you know, the question states, I was seeing that teachers were having a difficult time, like, you know, if the teacher was a second or third generation Mexican American teacher, they were having a difficult time relating culturally to the immigrant or first generation students in their classrooms. Um, the values changed a little bit. Um, I think it has a lot to do with social class, you know, or the ability or uh, ability to, um, you know, just have more financial resources. And so, you know, we do, some of us make, you know, and I can say myself in that uh, sometimes we want to provide uh, what we didn't have to our children. And sometimes we fail to teach them about, you know, the value and then the effort of, you know, actually accomplishing something, you know, for yourself, like, you know, the experience that I've gone, you know, that I went through. Um, I think some of that has been lost a little bit, but I think, you know, now I think the pandemic has helped us a little bit um, as far as all of us being in one household and being like, you know, stuck at home so that we can talk and have those courageous conversations with our children. And, you know, value, you know, really value what should be valued, your know, family ethics and, you know, and those uh, important um, skills of, of actually accomplishing something through your hard work. Um, so that's, that's my two cents on that question. Thank you, Dr. Viloria. Uh, does anybody else have anything that they want to add that wasn't addressed in Dr. Viloria's answer? Uh, I think in the pre-COVID time, you know, the classroom that we encountered was very different because the focus was on group learning. But now, uh, and actually, uh, uh, you know, the aspects which became very important, you know, are now they are very different because now I think a lot of the things the students are learning, they have to be self-motivated or they have to kind of act more on their own. So in that sense, some of the characteristics of personality, some of the characteristics of, you know, what comes with family, culture, a lot of these things, I think these have become more important. You know, there are some, you know, students who are much more driven, who get much more out of the class, uh, you know, in, in these settings. And I think even when we move to kind of, you know, quote unquote, normal day. But I think there is something that has fundamentally shifted in terms of, you know, education process. And I'm, I'm trying to grapple with it. I'm, I can't, I cannot articulate it properly because I'm also going through this, you know, process just as the students are. So all of the characteristics in, in a very structured classroom, a lot of time that didn't matter that much. But I think in the future, they are going to matter more. You know, that's my two cents. Thank you, Dr. Moman. 
Um, so we have another question. Um, so before I move on to that one, does anybody else have anything that they want to add uh, to this answer before we move on? So the next question that I have here is, when women have responsibilities, such as taking care of family, raising children and working, do you have any advice on how they can balance these responsibilities in order to pursue a PhD? I would like to answer that. Um, I think you need a very strong support system and you need to have people who believe in you. Uh, because um, getting a PhD is is tough. It's probably the hardest thing that you will do in life as far as commitment, time, research, you know, not sleeping, and just pushing through. Um, and because women typically um, have responsibilities to the family, not that men don't have, but women tend to be the ones um, that to take on a larger part of that responsibility, they need to be supported. Uh, so in my case, uh, when I was doing my PhD, I, I remarried and my husband was essential. He was such a, a, a rock of Gibraltar that, you know, he, I could just really, if I had a deadline to turn in a chapter or something, I knew I didn't have to cook. I didn't have to drive the kids to school. I didn't have to do anything. I could really concentrate on, on my, on my research and on my work. Um, so I, I would say the most important thing is to have to have people who believe in you, uh, to have people who are there to um, support you whenever and whatever you need. Um, I think a PhD is um, can be done definitely as a woman, definitely as a mother, definitely as somebody later in life. I am an example of that, but I could not have done it by myself. I really needed my colleagues, um, my family, and my professors to um, to believe in me and support me and to help me out in times when it was just very, very hard. So go for it. You know, you can do it. Um, I really, really encourage my students uh, to get PhDs if I see that they um, have the desire and that they have uh, the, 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 the push to do it and if they're ready. Um, I think we need more women with PhDs, so go for it. I would like to add something. You know, women tend not to prioritize themselves and their work. So whatever, you know, there will be always a lot of different kind of responsibilities around, right? But whatever is your passion, whether this is PhD or whether someone wants to see, you know, you have to prioritize, even if it's a small part of the time or, you know, like setting aside some time for yourself or some time, you know, for the work that you really want to do. So that I think is, is very, very important. Yeah, I'd like to also add that um, organization is key and um, being able to accomplish and balance all the different responsibilities in your life. Uh, I, for one, I also concur that you as a, as a woman, you know, because um, you are the stronghold of a household most of the time, or like a family, you know, they, you have a lot of people depending on you. So you have to take care of yourself first um, so that you can take care of others. And um, I, you know, I also concur that having a strong support group is, is essential to being able to accomplish your goals. Uh, but yeah, do not be afraid to say, you know what, I've had, um, I need some space. I also need to take care of myself so that I can continue and, and be of service to others. So and just care. management, I mean, the, the being able to manage your time. I mean, I would make note cards and I would go to my daughter's volleyball game. And if she wasn't playing, then I was looking at note cards. So just, you know, like, like uh, Dr. Gloria said, just, um, you know, organization and, and managing your time. All good advice. Thank you, ladies. Does anybody else uh, have anything to add before we move on to our last question? I would just like to add that you need to be selfish a little bit, you know, um, and then delegate a household chores. You can delegate that. It's very important to learn leadership, uh, time management, but delegate those these tasks to other people. You're not the only one in the household. So self, you know, be selfish a little bit. 
and then you can finish it. Agreed, agreed. All right, so the last question that we have here, in your opinion, who is a powerful woman? A woman who has control over her time can pursue what she wants in life. That's a powerful woman. Yeah, and I can also say that a woman that advocates for others uh, because you are, um, you'll see your your work and your belief system. I mean, not that you're gonna, you know, pass it on to everybody, but you, a part of you, is is growing in other people, and you, you know, it's and because you have shared and you have advocated for that person, and and then you can see them, you know, flourish. And I think that would make a a powerful one because it makes a woman proud of of being able to share those beliefs with other women, and you know, why not some men as well, you know, of course. But um, yeah, I mean, I think advocacy for others. Thank you, ladies. Okay, I know I said that was the last question, but we did get a very last minute question as soon as as uh, I thought I received the last question. So um, it says, I noticed that successful people and those that go on to accomplish great success in life have had great mentors in their lives. Do you agree that having good mentors have influenced your careers and how? Okay, so I would like to go first sure. because I I think I was being very blessed with uh, great mentors in my life. So um, uh, I once uh, while I was doing my graduate study, I asked my mentor to come in a very bad weather situation, and he came uh, traveling for one hour. I even couldn't go there to meet and do the experiment together. So I later when we met, uh, my professor didn't ask me why you didn't come. He told me. Are you okay? So I understood how how generous he was, and uh, throughout my whole graduate study, I actually, he actually stood by on my side when I was raising my kid. And uh, I think it is very important to have a mentor who understand your goals. And he actually uh, suggested me that uh, you can move to USA. You might find a better opportunity than in Japan, where I was struggling due to the language issue to get a position in the academia. So uh, I think my mentors whom I, I have met throughout my graduate study and postdoctoral years, they actually pushed me. They actually, um, they, they actually gave me the direction which way I should go uh, in further and I can succeed ahead. So I definitely say that having a great mentor would shape you uh, better in the future. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, does anybody else have anything that they want to add to that question? Yes, I, I concur with Dr. Hassan. Um, having mentors um, uh, in graduate school and in the PhD program is so important because um, of the commitment that it requires. To, so to have somebody who believes in you and can guide you and can encourage you at all times um, is, is really wonderful. And I've had several mentors in my in my life. And I remember one of my college professors um, in College Station, um, mm -hmm. she would ask me to call her at six uh, in the morning. And I uh, now I'm an early riser. I became an early riser because of this. But I wasn't an early riser. And I, and I said, oh, my goodness, I have to get up so early to call her. But I made the time and, and that hour uh, that I talked with her or 45 minutes that it was that I talked to her on the phone periodically a couple of times a week was became so important to me that uh, everything else kind of you know became easier because I knew I was going to be able to share whatever challenges I faced in our talks. So, yes, it's very important uh, to have um, good mentors uh, that push you along from one of your goals to the next and who believe in you and who are there to support you and to celebrate with you when you finally, you know, get that uh, that PhD or the, the, that master's degree and, and walk the stage and they're as proud or even prouder um, than you are. Great, thank you. And I'm sure you all would definitely want to have any mentees um, if the opportunity arises. 
Okay, so those are all the questions that we have from the audience. Um, and I just want to ask, does anybody have any closing thoughts uh, before we end today's panel? Well, I would urge my students to follow their passion, to take risks, you know, just go somewhere, try to learn new things. And again, uh, don't have fixed ideas. You know, whether we are talking about a particular discipline or uh, like other aspects of life, you know, like keep your mind open and then you'll see, you know, learning will become something that will become like something organic and enjoyable and that will be an enriching life. Yeah, I, I would also like to add that um, don't be afraid to ask questions. I, you know, I think all of us in the panel will, you know, can probably um, still share that we get nervous too. You know, we still get nervous when we're in certain and you know forums or in certain places and certain spaces. But um, you have to find the courage within you to ask questions. You know, and be open to learning. I would like to add that um, for the panel, I mean, for the audience, take calculated risk, approach yourself from your circle. And sometimes your mentor may not be in your own field. Like for me, my mentor is not a nurse. He's from a different field. So um, what I'm gonna say is that make yourself open, be open to ideas, and then get out of your comfort zone. You might not, you will not know what you'll, what you'll get until you really push yourself to, to go in there. Right, I'll just have... add one sentence that never lose your dream. For me, I traveled from Bangladesh to Japan and then from Japan to USA um, to become an academy, academy, to enter to academia in USA. So I think uh, my advice, last line advice would be don't ever lose your dream. I would also like to say that um, I really I'm so happy to be on this panel and I learned so much from each one of my colleagues. Um, and I really feel inspired also to pass some of this um, information down to uh, the next generation of, uh, of faculty of, of, of the females in, in our profession. So thank you very much for sharing that. But I agree with Dr. Hassan, uh, never, never lose your dream and, and um, you're you're capable of much more than you think you are. Don't ever sell yourself short. You you have it in you, and um, yeah, believe in yourself. Dr. Kazin, did you have anything that you wanted to add before we close the panel? Um, I just agree with what all of my colleagues have been saying, uh, particularly. Dr. Hassan, uh, you know, if you can, if you can think it, if you can dream it, you can be it. So, thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, ladies, for being a part of today's panel. Thank you to our audience as well for joining us. So, once again, everybody who is interested in participating in any campus activities uh, related to diversity and inclusion, or anybody who would like to know about TIDE activities and offerings, you can visit the university's diversity and inclusion website at tammy.edu slash diversity. You can stay connected with our Sue and Radcliffe Kiln Library by following them on Facebook, on Instagram, and Twitter. And also don't forget to follow our university social media accounts at TXAMIU on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on YouTube. Thank you all so much for joining us and we'll see you next time, Dust Devils. <laughs>